there will be a lot of overlap because this is really what has been on my heart and in my mind and right before my eyes for many, many months for the last year or two. And actually for the last 25 years or more, 25 years ago, next month, we'll, uh, we will celebrate the anniversary of the most significant human covenant I have ever made in my life with Kimberly Kirk Hahn now. But it was around that time in my life that I discovered the profound significance of covenant making and the profound difference between covenant making and contract making. Because I think most Americans assume that contracts and covenants are the same. I know I did. And it took me years of study and prayer and reflection and learning before I recognized the difference and then I began to recognize what difference the difference makes because it's enormous. Just without going into detail, when I first came to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ as my personal Savior and Lord, I was a troubled teen. I had just come out of juvenile court. I was trying my best to extricate myself from juvenile delinquency, but I discovered I didn't have the power within myself to do that. I needed a power that came from on high. And Christ came into my life. He took up his throne. He became the Lord of lords, the King of kings. He became the source of my strength slowly. It took time. It took struggle. And I, I ended up falling many times before I found more and more stability. But at that first period of my life where I had the grace of conversion, a personal relationship with Jesus Christ was really what it was all about. And the way I studied the Bible, I came to the conclusion with the help of my teachers that this stuff called sacraments, this stuff called liturgy, was, quite frankly, superstitious. In fact, at times I thought it bordered on magic, if not even sacrilege. Why would you have all of this ritual complicate the simple beauty of a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, obviously, I'm going to change my mind, and I'm also going to explain to you why, but I want to say something before I explain the changes that took place in my thinking, and that is a personal relationship is vital. Nothing I say today, nothing you'll hear this week, will in any way relativize the importance or trivialize the vitality of a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. A personal relationship with Jesus Christ is what we're talking about. I just want to clarify what kind of personal relationship we have. Because a personal relationship is something that I have with the guy who lives next door. Though I don't know him all that well, he's a hairdresser. He's a fine man but we don't have all that much in common, but we do have a personal relationship. Likewise, the garage mechanic down at the BP station, the bottom of the hill, I've got a personal relationship with Bill. But it isn't the same kind of thing I have with Kimberly, or the kids, or even, I hope, with many of you throughout this week. We will enter into something much more. It's that much more that I want to explore. It's that much more that I came to discover the hard way. Because I didn't just disagree with Catholics, I opposed them. But at the same time, I was much more committed to Scripture than I was committed to anti-Catholicism. And so I basically made a pledge to our Lord, I will go wherever your word leads me. I will believe whatever you teach me from your word, and I will try my best to do whatever it is you command me with the help of your grace, with your Holy Spirit. And as I began reading through the Bible in high school, I made a discovery that it's more than a person relationship with Jesus Christ. It's a covenant. It's a covenantal bond. And God, it seems, was never content to just simply leave us in some generic personal relationship. The language of the covenant is the language of the Bible. 
Now, you wouldn't be here if you didn't know words like this were going to be emanating from my mouth because I, I talk a lot about covenant, but that's because God's word teaches so much about covenant. The Bible is a covenant document. That's not just my opinion. That's an empirical fact that an atheist could see. Why? Because it's divided into the Old Testament and the, Old, the New Testament. And testament is just another word for what? Covenant. And in fact, testament is a Latin term that attempts to translate a much more biblical concept. Berit in Hebrew, diatheke in Greek, is typically understood and translated far better as what? Covenant. Old covenant, new covenant. So the Bible is a covenant book. God is a covenantal Lord. History is a covenantal plan. And the personal relationship that he wants to establish and maintain and grow and develop with each and every one of us is a covenant. So, having stated what might be obvious to most of us, we have to ask the question, what difference does a covenant make? Well, again, just to summarize quickly, a covenant differs from a contract in a very profound way. Just a very simple description of the difference is this, that in a contract, you exchange goods and services. Property changes hands. This is yours and now that is mine because we made a promise. I gave you my word. You made a promise. You gave me your word. And the proof of that word was the signature that I might have attached to a contract and your name that you signed. So the name of the human parties is the sign or the signature of a contract. It's a glue that holds. But in a covenant, you've got something much more than the exchange of property. A covenant has to begin with a contract. A covenant can't get started without promises. But a covenant goes far beyond, not against, but beyond a contract. Because more than simply exchanging goods and services, it's the exchange of lives. I am yours and you are mine. That's the language of a covenant. And ancient Israelites understood that far better than modern Americans. And so it behooves us, if we're going to try to build our lives upon Scripture and tradition, upon the Word of God as Catholic Christians, that we understand this difference and figure out what difference it makes. So in a covenant, lives are exchanged. I am yours and you are mine. And that also involves property, doesn't it? You know, when I got married... I didn't just give myself to Kimberly. She didn't just give herself to me. Our bank accounts also became one. And so also our, our, our holdings, as meager as they were. And so it is the exchange of property, but even more, the exchange of persons. It is making promises, but even more than that, it is what? Swearing an oath. If you've gotten even 50 pages in Swear to God, I think by now you've seen the difference between a contract and a covenant is especially clarified when you study the difference between a promise where you give somebody your word and an oath where you invoke the holy name of God. That is the definition of an oath. To invoke God's name so that God will be witness God will be judge. If a promise is the glue that holds a contract together, an oath is the cement that binds two people together because now suddenly God is the bond. A contract is binding, but a covenant is far more binding. In fact, I won't go into this in any detail, but for the last 25 years or so, I've been keeping track of other differences. I wrote a paper many years ago while I was still a Protestant. And I know some of you, you know, are just beginners, others are intermediates, and others aspire to be more advanced students of Scripture. So I'm going to give you just a little footnote here. I want to identify just briefly seven differences between a covenant and a contract. First one, at the point of determination... When you determine a contract, you negotiate. So if I see somebody who's got a book I've been looking for, I might offer him $5. He might see the gleam in my eye and know that I'd be willing to pay a lot more. So the dickering begins. No, 
35? How about 10? How about 30? And we might meet in the middle. But the very determination of that contract is subject to mutual negotiation. So when contracts are determined, they are mutual. When covenants are established, they're unilateral. They're not bilateral, they're unilateral. Why? Because the terms of a covenant are divinely imposed. Now, I might dicker with somebody who has a book that I want, and we might agree on the price or not. But ultimately, that contract is really subject to the bilateral and mutual negotiation. But suppose I discover that the most beautiful woman on Grove City College's campus is interested in me, and we cultivate a relationship, and we see it going someplace, from friendship to courtship, and then finally engagement, where I proposed to her in January of 1979 on Rainbow Bridge while the snow was falling. We'll tell you about that later. <laughs> there was a practical joke involved. In any case, when I proposed marriage to her, what was it that I was proposing? Well, it was not something subject to our mutual negotiation. I, I couldn't have said to her, let's try it out for a year and then see where we are. By definition, that would not have been marriage. That would have been called concubinage in the ancient world. She would not have been my wife. She would have been my concubine. We would have been exchanging goods and services, and that contract would be subject to renewal. If I proposed marriage to her and she gave consent, there was a promise from me to her and from her to me. There was a promise to God on the day of her wedding. That, by the way, is a vow. A vow is just a special kind of promise. A vow is a promise that we both make to God. It's not to be confused with an oath, although everybody seems to confuse them. You've got promises among humans. A promise to God is called a vow. But when you stop invoking your own name, God, I give you my word, and you invoke his name, so help me God, that is the when you've arrived at the level of what? A covenant oath. So, on August 18th, 1979, we made a covenant. We made a covenant because while, you know, we could go back and forth, there were certain things that were subject to bilateral mutual negotiation, like the garbage. <laughs> Do you remember that, Kimberly? <laughs> See, my mom always took out the garbage. But her dad always took out the garbage in their home. And so, in our apartment, up in Ipswich, there on the third floor, after about a week or so, I noticed the aroma, you know. And that aromatic distraction, I basically assigned to her. And unwittingly, she had done it to me. And then finally, we had to deal with this. And I let her have, no, no, she let her, I, I, she won. That sort of thing is subject to negotiation. But, you know, if I had said to her after a month of marriage, look, there's somebody else I'm interested in. Oh, you can just feel your own hackles. Then suddenly it wouldn't be marriage. Because marriage is exclusive. It's her and her alone to the exclusion of everybody else. It's permanent. It's lifelong. It isn't as long as we both shall love. It's as long as we both shall live. For better, for worse for richer, for poor, in sickness and in health. Who decided all of that? God did. And it was unilaterally imposed by God because marriage is not something we made up. Marriage is a divine institution. And so the essential terms that define this covenant are divine. They're divinely imposed. So when covenants are determined, covenants like marriage, they're divinely predetermined. The terms of the covenant are unilaterally imposed by God. Think of another covenant, this one between God and Israel. When they arrived at Sinai, Moses went up as the mediator. But what did he do? Was there a dickering process? What do you mean, ten commandments? No, we'll accept five, and we're going to review these and figure out which ones are acceptable. 
No. When God made his covenant with Israel, I will be your God, you will be my people, we will exchange lives, I am yours, you are mine, and here are the terms of the covenant. And they were not subject to negotiation. It's sort of like, take it or leave it? No, you take it or die. (laughs) This is the moral law of the covenant. This is the law by which you will live if you reject it You don't walk away from the bargaining table. You die. You can see a profound difference. For people to confuse covenants and contracts is dangerous. And we can see why we're in such trouble today when it comes to the definition of marriage. There's a second difference. I've already alluded to it. The second difference is at the point of initiation. Contracts are based upon promises. It's a promissory initiation. That is how contracts are made and kept. You exchange promises, and once the mutual pledge is exchanged, then the property changes hands, and the contract is complete. But with a covenant, initiation can only take place through an oath. And an oath is what? When you invoke God's name, And why do you invoke God's name? Because our help is in, what? The name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. So help me God, when you invoke God's name, a promise, a contract, has been transformed into an oath, a covenant. Glue now has been supplemented by cement. In fact, one-tenth of the Decalogue is devoted to this kind of activity. What is it? The second commandment. After you identify the right God, you shall worship him and him alone. What is the next command? You shall not take his name in vain. Notice that the Lord does not say, you shall not take my name upon your lips. God wants us to invoke his name whenever we need his help. But God does not want us to invoke his name dishonestly or insincerely. So what does the commandment add? He will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. See, if I give you a promise in order to make a contract, and you go ahead and give me that book, and I say, well, here's an IOU, but I never give you the money, then you know, my word is my honor, and I have dishonored my own name. I am a liar. I have cheated. I have defrauded that other party. You know, I might go to court. There might be some kind of tort settlement or whatever. But it's very different when you look at a covenant. Because initiation takes place by means of oath swearing, God's holy name is now attached to my performance. Why do I invoke invoke God's name? Because I need God's help. So help me God. Look around you and think about this. When do we put people under oath? When they need God's help. Who are the people who come under oath? Can you think from your own experience? What is it? Judges. They come under oath. Witnesses. Military personnel. In the Army, Navy, Marines, Air Force, you all have to swear an oath. What else? Witnesses who take the the stand and give testimony. Presidents, officials, doctors, yes. What do all of these people have in common besides the fact that they all swear oaths? the Hippocratic Oath, or the Oath of Office, or the Oath of Military Service, or the Oath of Public Service. They all perform what? Public service. Not just private service, an individual gain. That's contractual. That's upon which the economy is based. But society is more than the economy, although we sometimes forget that. Society is a whole network of relationships that involve much more than property and goods and services. What do all of these people who swear oaths have in common besides public service? What makes their job a public service and not just simply a private pursuit? What are they dealing in? Power? What kind of power? Because money's power in the economy. That's powerful. It's the power of life and death. Think about what all of these people have in common. Soldiers, whether they're in the Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, Coast Guard, they all have the power of life and death. 
Can we trust ordinary mortals with that much power? No. But we have to. Because we need protection. We need defense. Judges. Attorneys. Yes, attorneys swear oaths. And witnesses too. And why? Because when it comes to justice, the people who administer justice have the power of what? Life and death. Freedom or incarceration. So what do we do? We put them under oath. The judges when they begin, the lawyers when they attain the bar, witnesses when they take the stand. Why? Because the temptation to lie is as great for those people as the temptation to kill indiscriminately might be in the armed forces. The temptation to say something that isn't true. Just like deserting under fire or killing or disobeying. The armed services, the place of justice, the courtroom where you have witnesses, attorneys and judges, doctors who have power over life and death. I mean, what price wouldn't you pay if your only child and his life was on the line? And so, since the 4th century BC, the Hippocratic Oath has bound physicians until very recently. And then politicians. The presidential oath of office in January of next year. Every politician swears the oath of office. Policemen swear oaths. Firemen swear oaths. Whenever people are given the power of life and death, they swear oaths. Why? Because they need God's help, and we know it. And we can't trust them, but we have to. So help them, God, and they subject themselves to God's judgment. Or I'll be damned. That's what every oath is. It's a two-sided coin. Heads is God's help. Tails is God's judgment. And in fact, when you see a witness take the stand or a politician swear the oath of office, we actually hear nowadays only smaller abbreviated forms of the oath that initiates a covenant. Originally, politicians, going back to the early 1800s, Professor Rushdoony has has written that uh, politicians used to swear the oath of office, presidents did, with the Bible turned to Deuteronomy 28. That is a chapter filled with blessings and curses. If we keep the covenant, you've got 15 verses describing God's blessings, the prosperity, the stability that will come. But if you break God's covenant, if you violate your oath of office, you've got more than 50 verses of curses that describe pestilence and famine, loss and warfare, captivity and exile. And the fuller form of the oath of office was invoking the name of God, invoking the judgment of God and saying, may the curses recorded in this book come upon me and mine if I am unfaithful to God's help. So, all of these people come under oath to initiate covenants of public service. What does an oath do? Does it guarantee that the witness will tell the truth? No, it does guarantee God's help though, doesn't it? So help me God. When we invoke the name of God, God hears us, God helps us, but he does not take away our free will. So what can the witness do? After swearing an oath, invoking God's name, and getting God's help, he can spurn that help. But what suddenly has happened? If he had just been telling that same lie to you privately, that lie would be a sin, a private sin. But now suddenly, what has it become? When a witness tells a lie under oath, it's no longer just a moral sin. It is a public crime. What do we call it? Perjury. What is it? Pur jure. A jury is the Latin term to swear an oath. You know, right now, we find ourselves in a desperate predicament, don't we, as a society? Because we've got politicians, we've got all kinds of people entering into covenants, swearing oaths and violating them, perjuring themselves, releasing curses upon themselves, their loved ones, and our society. It reminds me of this, this, this drunk who was down on his hands and knees one night under a street light. And this fellow's come walking along and he goes, what's wrong? And he looks up and goes, I lost my contact lens. And so, you know, being a helpful sort of friend, the guy got down on his hands and knees and began looking around for it, you know. And after like 10 or 15 minutes of searching every little nook and cranny of that sidewalk, the man turned to the drunk and said, 
are you sure you, you lost it here? And he said, no, no, I, I lost it two blocks down the street, but this was my first light. <laughs> we prefer to look for things where it's easier, you know, where there's light, where it shouldn't be too difficult. But the fact is, you've got to go back and grope around even if it's dark. We often prefer easy answers to hard ones. We just think that voting in pro-life politicians is really all we need. Well, however important that may be, and I think it is, it isn't even the first baby step to the kind of reconstruction that God wants to bring about in our society and in each and every one of our lives and our homes and our parishes as well. So at the level of determination and now at the level of initiation, what a profound difference it makes to form a covenant by swearing an oath as distinct from making a contract just by exchanging promises. The third one is the level of obligation. In a contract, obligations are conditional. I only have to give you my money if you give me that book. It's a conditional obligation. So we have mutually determined and promised ourselves to this exchange. And if I take your book but keep my money, you can either try to use legal action to get the money, or you can take your book back. Because that book is only mine on the condition that I subject myself to the terms that we've mutually negotiated. So it's strictly conditional. But in a covenant, the obligations are unconditionally binding. You keep the covenant in order to be blessed. If you break the covenant, you're going to be cursed. But here's the catch that a lot of people don't realize, that because covenants have terms that are divinely predetermined, and we invoke God's name in an oath to get God's help to do what we might not be able to do for ourselves because of our weakness, we are now bound unconditionally to certain obligations. So, for example, I have a friend who was, who's been in a marriage where the partner was unfaithful. That partner did not fulfill the obligations of that covenant. And so, thinking contractually, it would be easy for this other person who has been faithful to just kind of wipe their hands and say, I'm out of here. But can you do that? No, you can't. Because the marriage covenant, like all covenants, are not only exclusive, but permanent. Permanent in the sense of indissoluble. Why? Because God's holy name is the cement that binds, and as Jesus says in Matthew 19, what God has joined together, let not man put asunder. And Jesus is not just saying that it's, you know, bad. It's a bad move to break up. When you look at the force of what Jesus says, what God has joined together, let not man put asunder. He's not just saying you shouldn't divorce. He's saying if God is the one who has bound two people together, if God, Almighty God, is the cement that unites the two, and Almighty God is the one who used his power to unite them, to make them one, just how strong do you think you are? Just how strong do you think your court system is? It might be powerful, but it is no match for Almighty God. And so if God's power, God's name, God's might is what made the two one, it isn't just bad morality to think that you can break it apart. As G.K. Chesterton said, it's bad metaphysics. You overestimate your own power. You overestimate the ability of the courtroom. And so, what happens in the church's teaching? I first encountered this when I was still outside the church as a Protestant. What happens to the faithful spouse when there is infidelity? Are you released from your obligations? No. You are unconditionally obligated to keep your covenant so that when the other person doesn't keep the obligations of the covenant, what happens? In a contract, it's 50-50. But in a covenant, it's 100-100. And when another person doesn't give 100%, he 
if they only give 90, 80, 70, or maybe only 10%? Does that mean you only have to give 90, 80, 70, or maybe even only 10%? No. This is the mystery that we miss. Because when Israel breaks the covenant with God, what does that do? Does that release God from being faithful? No. That obligates God even further. He has to now administer that covenant in a way that is punitive, that is restorative. What does God say to Israel when they violate the terms of the covenant? Not deals off, I'll go find some other nation that appreciates me more. But we are in a covenant. It is unbreakable. It is indissoluble. It is permanent. And so if you fail to fulfill your obligations, you just trigger more obligations on my part to punish you. And God doesn't punish Israel because he stops loving them. God punished Israel because he couldn't stop loving them. Because that covenant was so binding. It was so permanent. He was bound to punish them because they're still his sons and daughters even when they're rebellious. Do I punish my kids because I stop loving them? No, I punish them because I can't stop loving them. I don't punish the neighbor's kids, though they often deserve it much more than my kids. <laughs> so the obligations of the covenant are unconditional. What must the faithful spouse sometimes do? What does the church allow the faithful bride or the groom to do in the case of infidelity? The legal terminology is separation of bed and board. What does that mean? If you persist in your adultery impenitently, we are no longer going to sleep or eat together. Why? Because the deal's off. No. The fact is, I have counseled couples for whom the faithful party preferred to stay with the unfaithful one. Why? Because living alone is lonely. Separating yourself from an unfaithful and impenitent spouse can be indescribably hard. And so at times it's easier. But what does the church sometimes prescribe? Sometimes you actually trigger the moral obligation where you have to, morally speaking, you are obligated to not have relations and not even board with that person. Why? Not because the deal's off, but precisely because the deal's still on. But the deal is a covenant, and the obligations are unconditional. And so it isn't 50-50. It's 100-100. And if, that only, if the other person is only giving you 50, then it becomes 150-50. If they're only giving you 10%, then it's 190-10. At this point, we begin to wonder to ourselves, what have we gotten ourselves into? Who would do that? Well, society needs it. But we know enough about human nature to realize Nobody can undertake that responsibility. Nobody can bear those kinds of burdens. And the fact is, we're all weak. We're prone to temptation. We've fallen before, some more than others. And so how in the world could we undertake such obligations as marriage or political office or military service? We shouldn't even think it's possible apart from divine assistance. So help me, God. I want to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I want to live fidelity, and all of fidelity, and only that, all of my life. So help me God. We invoke God's name. Our help is in the name of the Lord, because he made heaven and earth. Or as Father Richard said, you know, God is God and we're not, and he spends 90% of his time trying to convince us of that. Right? In our pride, which is the root of all sin, we have this unreasonable self-estimate. We think we're capable of doing things we're not really capable of doing. What counteracts pride? Humility. What does humility lead us to? Help me, God. I'm in over my head. I am too weak for this, and yet other people need me. So help me, God. We invoke God's name. So at the level of determination, at the level of initiation, now at the level of obligation, Covenants and contracts differ profoundly. The fourth one is at the level of application. Contracts are limited in their application. 
if I make a deal with Mike Aquilina back there for a copy of his book, you know, and I give him $25 and he gives me that book, I can't turn around and say, okay, now, Mike, you are obligated to sell me whatever other titles might be in your library for whatever price I dictate. You are obligated to let me use whatever other property you own because I am the Lord of your life. <laughs> he would think I was deluded, and I would be. <laughs> because contracts don't trigger that sort of thing. Contracts are limited in their application. In fact, once I give him the money and he gives me the book, he can go his merry way. He can say, Scott, you're strange, have a nice life, and have no more dealings with me. Because that's how limited contracts are in their application. But co covenants are unlimited in their application. I can say to my wife, hey, look, I worked nine to five. I got home for dinner. I, I even helped the kids get dressed and ready for bed. I'm out of here. The rest of the evening is mine. You might see me at 12. You might see me at 1 a.m. I'll come in when I come in. But this part of my life is mine and not yours. No way. Some men may be in for a big surprise, but the marital covenant, like all covenants, are unlimited in their application. When God made a covenant with Israel, what did that covenant apply to? Their religious life, so they prayed. Their liturgical life, so they worshipped. That was the heart of their covenant life with God. But when you look at the law of the covenant, what else does it touch upon? Economics. Politics, education, medicine. It'd be a lot easier to ask, what doesn't God's covenant law touch upon? And the answer is nothing, because it's all-encompassing. It's unlimited in its application. When we enter into covenant bonds, we subject our entire lives to God for the sake of serving the common good and giving ourselves to the others to whom we've pledged ourselves. Society can function without this. You know, in my book, I have a quote from St. Augustine. He said this, Peace is secured by the oaths of barbarians for whole provinces. Without such oaths, Augustine said, I don't know whether we can find anywhere on earth to live. It's true. We have to rediscover. We have to recover what has been lost. The sense of the binding nature of covenant oaths for our marriages and all of our other sworn commitments. If we do, we will rediscover the power of commitment is the very power of God. And it will release the very grace of Christ into our lives and our society. It'll transform our homes and our nation. If we don't, we're like that drunk looking for the contact lens under the street light because it's easy. We got to go where it's dark. We got to go where it's hard. We got to search, even though it's going to be hard to recover all of this. But without it, we don't stand a chance. But God wants this for us more than we want it for ourselves. So help us, God. We can pray again and again. Do you know the most common form of an oath among Christian peoples is prayer? How do we begin most every prayer? In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. What do we just do? Invoke God's name, ask God's help. We just put ourselves under oath. And that's how we end most prayers. The Hebrew word amen is an oath formula that binds people by invoking God's name, tapping God's judgment in order to secure his blessing, but we also pay the price because we subject ourselves to his judgment, to the curse. And then remember this, cursing is not God getting even with us, God rejecting us. God restores us through punishment. His punishments, his covenant curses are remedial. They're expressions of love. He's not rejecting us. He refuses to reject us. And so he sometimes afflicts us with whatever he knows we need. So at the level of determination, initiation, obligation, application, covenants are unlimited in their application, whereas contracts are limited. And now we come to the fifth, at the point of administration. Contracts are administered by human power. Covenants are administered by God. 
So when contracts are broken, human power can be used. Coercion, whatever else, negotiation. But they're limited in their application, and so they're also limited in their administration. And so humans can privately administer almost all of their contractual affairs. But when it comes to a covenant, covenants are always divinely administered. And why? Because when you invoke God's name, he has staked his reputation to this commitment that you have made. So if you perjure yourself under oath, or if you are unfaithful in marriage, you have dragged the holy name of God through the muck and the mud of your own selfishness. And that's why he adds, he will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. God is obligated to punish us whenever we violate our oaths or perjure ourselves. Why? Not only because the glory and holiness of his own name is at stake, but because we are his children. That's why we have the right to invoke his name. And so as his children, we are beloved, and so he does whatever it takes in administering this covenant, even if it means inflicting pain upon those whom he loves. And so we have to understand this difference. Divine administration. This shows us that the moral order of covenant relationships is not subject to congressional law. Congress has to enact laws that reflect the moral order of God's covenant. When it comes to marriage, when it comes to family, when it comes to all of these other areas of life where we invoke God's name, where we swear God's, where we swear an oath, what does that mean? Well, let's just take a practical example. What do you suppose would happen if uh, Congress decided on Monday to repeal the law of gravity? I mean, 435 representatives vote unanimously. It's a bipartisan action. And then all 100 senators concur. And the next day, the president meets them in the Rose Garden, signs the bill into law. And they all celebrate by getting up on the White House roof and jumping off together. <laughs> Don't clap. No, we need them. So help them, God. <laughs> what would happen? Would they break the law of gravity since they had repealed it unanimously? No, they'd demonstrate the law of gravity. And that law would break whichever of their bones hit the ground first. Why? Because in the physical order, God's laws are firmly fixed. And we know that. Where we get a little confused is the moral order. Where spiritual reality is defined and bound by God just as permanently and truly as it is in the physical material order. And so God is bound to administer these covenant relationships according to commitments that were made by his name, with his help, subjecting ourselves to his judgment, and not just a judge in a courtroom, but a father in a family, because that's what covenants do. Covenants establish sacred bonds of kinship. The moral order that the covenant establishes is a family bond between God our Father and his beloved sons and daughters who must live the covenant by being loving brothers and sisters, loving husbands and wives, loving and obedient sons and daughters. In ancient Israel, to swear a covenant was to establish sacred kinship bonds. Even if you made a covenant with a total stranger, like Abraham does with Abimelech. In Genesis 21, here's a Philistine. But Abraham makes a covenant, he swears an oath, and then when you get to Genesis 26, just five chapters later, Abimelech and his family refer to Abraham and Isaac and their kinsfolk as brothers. Why? They're not related, not in any immediate or perceivable way, but because Abraham made a covenant with Abimelech in Genesis 21. They're calling each other brothers in Genesis 26. Even after Abraham died, it's true. Because even pagans back then understood the difference between contracts and covenants, promises and oaths. Even Abimelech, the uncircumcised Philistine, lived out his covenant commitments. It's an amazing thing. The sixth difference 
might be obvious at this point, almost self-evident, and that is at the level of motivation. Why do you enter into contracts? The profit motive, for self-interest, for gain. Why do you enter into covenants? Well, presumably you want to get something out of it. I mean, it isn't like masochists need apply, you know. We enter into covenants for better, for richer, in health. But what is it we swear ourselves to? What is it we bound each other to? For richer or for poorer, for better or for worse. We swore in that vow which became a covenant oath, a sacramentum. That's the Latin word for oath if you've read the book. We bound ourselves for richer, for poorer, for better or for worse. We explicitly acknowledge the possibility that we could end up worse off with each other than better off. But society needs us to perform a public service as faithful spouses and as loving parents to raise up the next generation. Every child has a natural right to be born of marital love and to be raised in marital love. It's a fundamental violation of the natural law for children to be raised otherwise. So what is the motivation for a covenant as distinct from the profit motive? This is self-interest this is self-sacrifice. This is the profit motive. This is agape, as Father Richard was explaining. This is self-sacrificing, disinterested love. Is anybody here inherently capable of this sort of love? Don't fool yourselves. Not one of us is capable of giving ourselves as much as a spouse will need. Not one politician in our land is capable intrinsically on his own power, on her, her own strength, of giving herself or himself as completely as society might need. So help them God. So help me God. So help Kimberly. It isn't just about profit or self-interest. It's about love, agape, self-sacrifice, self-giving love. That is what we bind ourselves to. That's why we invoke God's name. That's why we enter into covenants. That's why an oath is needed and not merely a promise. And that's why sacramentum, the Latin word for oath, is what societies need to preserve these commitments, to keep these commitments, and to make life possible, and to make love possible. Finally, the seventh difference is this. Duration. At the level of duration, contracts are temporary. In fact, they can even be brief. You can enter into a contract with somebody and be over and done and out in a minute. The property and the money of exchanged hands, you gave them the word, and vice versa, and it's over and done. Temporary duration. Whereas covenants are what? Permanent. Not only did Abraham enter into a covenant with Abimelech, but Isaac and Abimelech's son were bound. Wait a second. They didn't even have a choice. That's right. That's the way kinship is. Did you elect your parents? Did you elect your siblings? Did you contract for, you know, your aunts and uncles? No. But in a society such as ours, where the individual is the only thing that matters, and individualism and experientialism define the extent of commitments, then when I want out, I'm out. And when my experience is no longer positive but negative, then no one can bind me. Individualism, experientialism, leads to moral relativism, and it leads to covenant breaking. The problem with covenant breaking is like gravity breaking. You're not breaking the laws so much as the laws are breaking up homes and cities, parishes and dioceses. Sin is more than broken laws. Sin is broken lives, broken hearts, broken homes. And this is what Christ has came to redeem us from. The old covenant was based upon this reality. And we broke it. And so a new covenant became necessary. Well, how did it happen? I want to conclude with just this reflection. In fact, let's turn with me. Turn with me now to, to Genesis 20, 21, because... This is the first covenant in the Bible made between humans. I've already referred to it a couple of times. It's the covenant that Abimelech and Abraham both swore. Genesis 20, 
In Genesis 21, there's discord between neighbors. And Abimelech recognizes that his neighbor Abraham has a special prerogative. God is with you in all that you do. Now therefore swear to me here by God that you will not deal falsely with me or with my offspring. He understands the duration of this covenant is not just once I die, then it's over. But make a covenant with me and with my offspring. Deal hesed. That's the term in Hebrew that's almost the equivalent of agape. You deal lovingly. You deal loyally. You will not deal falsely with me or with my offspring or with my posterity. Abimelech, the pagan Philistine, understands that if I can get Abraham to make a covenant with me, then not only is that going to protect me, but it's going to protect my children and their children and their children's children. For me, my offspring and my posterity, because a covenant is permanent in its duration. And he seems to just presuppose this. Even though this is the first time a covenant is made between humans in the scriptural record. Obviously, covenants have been made many times before now. This is the first biblical account of it, though. Continue reading with me. In verse 24, Abraham agrees. He said, I will swear. So he's agreed to do it sometime in the near future. And so that comes to pass in verse 26. Abimelech said, verse 27, Abraham took sheep and oxen and gave them to Abimelech, and the two men made a covenant. Abraham set seven lambs apart, and Abimelech said, what is the meaning of the seven lambs that you've set apart? And he said, these seven lambs you will take from my hand, that you will be witness for me that I dug this well. Therefore, that place was called Beersheba. Beersheba, the southernmost tip of the nation of Israel, got its name Beersheba because there both of them swore, swore an oath. They made a covenant at Beersheba. How do you make a covenant? You swore an oath. Even the pagan Philistines know that if you want to really bound, bind yourself to another person, enter a covenant. How do you enter a covenant? You swore an oath. How do you swear an oath? Seven lambs. Why seven? Well, what was that place called from that point on? Beersheba. Beersheba. What does it mean? Look in your Bible at the bottom of the page. Every English translation gives it to you. It's the well of the seven, or what? The well of the oath. Because the Hebrew word for covenant oath, to swear a covenant, is to sheva, to seven yourself. Why? Well, we all knew before this week the sacred symbolism of the number seven. But we usually assume it just is the number of completeness. It's much more than completeness. It's completeness because it's the number of covenant making and covenant keeping. It's the number of oath swearing. Abraham could just take for granted that here a pagan Philistine understood the significance of seven lambs. The seven lambs that are offered as a sacrifice are my oath. They are my covenant. They are the sacred pledge of kinship to you and from you to me. Okay, so from that point on, both parties call that place the well of the oath, the well of the seven. What's so astounding to me is not how much is asserted in this section of Genesis 21, but how much is assumed. Not how much factual information is categorically listed, but how much Abraham and Abimelech could take for granted that they both knew, even though one's a Hebrew and one's a pagan Philistine, they both understand covenant making, oath swearing, leads to sacred kinship for me and you and for our offspring and our posterity forever. Amen. Why? Because to seven yourself was to swear a covenant oath and to bind yourself. And there is no, there's no other explanation needed. There's no other explanation given. It's only modern readers of the Bible who have trouble. The seven lambs, they called it Beersheba, well of the seven, or well of the oath. What does that mean? Well, the ancient writer could presuppose that his ancient readers understood that to make a covenant is to swear an oath, and that is literally to seven oneself. I didn't learn this until I took Hebrew. And I had these long vocabulary lists to memorize. And Shiva was on the list. And it said to swear a covenant oath. And then in parentheses he added, to seven oneself. 
I raised my hand. I didn't want to memorize more than I had to. I said, this is the only one that gives two definitions. Do we have to memorize both? And Professor Hugenberger said, memorize both. And I said, what does it mean to seven yourself? And he said, well, it's based upon the Hebrew numeral for seven. And I said, what does it mean? He goes, ask me after class. I don't think he really knew, but we sat down in the cafeteria right after class. An hour and a half later, we both got up and our heads were spinning with excitement because he told me when we sat down, I never have been asked the question before, but let's explore it. What does it mean to seven yourself, to swear an oath, to make a covenant through the seven? Well, we went back in the Genesis 1, and suddenly we realized, why did God bother to make the world in six days and then hallow the Sabbath on the seventh? Why didn't he just make it in one and then, you know, seal it on the second day? Or why not three and then four? What's the... It seems arbitrary. But in the Hebrew way of thinking, and in the Christian way of thinking even more so, seven is the sacred number of the covenant oath that binds us. And so God couldn't have been done in six days. He couldn't be done until he had sevened himself, until the Creator had made himself our Father, until he transformed creatures into his own sons and daughters, until the creation of the cosmos was transformed into a home into a palace, into a holy temple. That's what the Sabbath was for ancient Israelites. It was God's time signature. It was the way he fashioned creation. He carved his covenant into the cosmos so we would discover that he is our father. We are his family. We are beloved sons and daughters. We are brothers and sisters, and we can call on his name because he sevened himself. When Noah was told to make the ark, what was the purpose? God said in 6.18, I want to renew my covenant with you. Renewing a covenant points back to the original covenant creation that God wanted to renew. How did he have Noah do it? Spare all the animals. How many animals did he take aboard the ark? A pair of each, right? A male and female, except for the clean animals. How many clean animals did he take aboard the ark? Seven. Why? Well, what are clean animals? You know, like cats that kind of lick themselves so they're always clean? What is a clean animal versus unclean? Every ancient Hebrew knew a clean animal is what God will accept as a holy sacrifice. So what does Noah do? As soon as he disembarks, builds an altar, offers a sacrifice, and the seven clean animals are that which God used to what? Renew his covenant. He'd sevened himself with the whole human race through a new founding father named Noah. And it continues on long after Abraham. When you get to ancient Israel, there at Mount Sinai, and you read Leviticus 23, how many festivals are there in the liturgical calendar? Seven. You knew that even if you can't name them, right? What's the first one? The Sabbath, the seventh day. What's the next one? Passover. It's like the 4th of July, Christmas and Easter ro rolled up in one. It's when they became a nation, consecrated as God's covenant people. So you got the Sabbath and then Passover. And immediately following the Passover, what do you have? The Feast of Unleavened Bread. And guess how many days that lasts? Seven days. What's the fourth feast in the Jewish calendar? Pentecost. That's kind of a Latinized translation. It means 50. But what is literally Pentecost? It's Shavuot. It's literally the Feast of Oaths, the Feast of Weeks, the Feast of Sevens. It's seven sevens, seven weeks after Passover. The 50th day you celebrate. So you've got the Sabbath, Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is seven days, the Feast of Weeks, which is seven weeks henceforth, and then in the seventh month, you've got the last three. How appropriate. In Leviticus 23, you've got the Rosh Hashanah, right, which is a new year. Then you've got Yom Kippur, which is the Day of Atonement. And then you also have the Feast of Booths, Sukkot, seven days of feasting in the seventh month. What is God trying to teach his people? To live the covenant as his family. As I did, so you do. I worked for six days, not because I couldn't get it done in one, but because I knew in advance that you couldn't. You've got to work, and then you've got to worship. 
You got to labor, then you got to set time aside for liturgy. You got to do that which is secular, but you've got to orient it toward that which is sacred. You got to find a rhythm to life, but it's imposed upon us by the one who knows us better than we know ourselves, and he loves us more than we're able to love ourselves. And he keeps the covenant. And it isn't just in the year. What do you call the seventh year? The sabbatical. I just got one. And then what do you call seven, seven years? The year of Jubilee. It's the year of Pentecost. Just as Pentecost is like the day of Jubilee. And so God has written the very rhythm of his covenant into time and space. Our life is meant to be liturgical. And not just our relationship to God, but with one another. With our spouses, with our kids, there's a certain rhythm. There's a certain way of life that is not merely contractual but covenantal. It isn't just economic, it is domestic, it is marital, it is parental, it is fraternal. And this is what the new covenant is all about. Because once Adam broke the old, and Noah renewed it, but then he ended up drunk in Genesis 9, naked pronouncing a curse upon his grandson. And then Abraham, even faithful Abraham, bypasses Sarah, takes a slave wife as a concubine, Hagar, and tries to fulfill God's promises on his own power. Bad idea. Have I learned that lesson many times? Whenever we try to fulfill God's promises on our own power, we almost always end up delaying the fulfillment and complicating the process. Over and over again, God makes a covenant with Adam, he breaks it. Noah, he breaks it. Abraham, he breaks it. Moses, he breaks it. David, an adulterer and a murderer, he breaks it. Until finally a new Adam comes and the sixth covenant is established with Christ, the new Adam, a new creation. And by the way, if the seventh day is the Sabbath, what do you suppose awaits us on the last day of history? The eternal Sabbath. When we enter into the significance of the seventh covenant, which is everlasting rest that God will grant to all of us. But for now, we still have to labor in faith and trust in this sixth covenant. But it's a new covenant. How do we know it's a new covenant? What has Christ given us? You can't have a covenant if you don't swear an oath. And once you swear an oath, what have you done? You seven yourself. What is the sevenfold covenant that we are now in? The seven sacraments. Baptism has done for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. It's made us not children of Fred and Molly Lou Hahn, but children of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Brothers and sisters to one another. Confirmation does what puberty could never do. It doesn't release natural hormones, but supernatural hormones to make us spiritual adolescents, apostles, warriors. Eucharist gives us what no dad could ever give his family as a breadwinner. The bread of life. Reconciliation heals us of a disease that is far worse than cancer or AIDS. Mortal sin takes out divine life. Reconciliation resurrects us to God's life even more than Jesus resurrected Lazarus. That was just back to earthly physical life. And so marriage is a sacramentum. It is an oath. It is a covenant priesthood is a glorious one as well and then last rites the anointing of the sick to prepare ourselves for the ultimate homecoming for the ultimate family reunion in heaven we get bread for the journey so that we can journey all the way home to the heavenly jerusalem the sevenfold covenant the new covenant is how we live and breathe and have our being it's what makes us what we really are sons and daughters of god i want to conclude with this statement from the Catechism, 1828, the practice of the moral life animated by charity and the power of the Holy Spirit gives to the Christian the spiritual freedom of the children of God. That's what Jubilee was all about. It gave the slaves their freedom. It returned them to their ancestral inheritance. This is what the Holy Spirit is given to us for. The spiritual freedom of the children of God he no longer stands before God as a slave in servile fear or as a mercenary looking for wages, 
but as a son responding to the love of him who first loved us. And then we have St. Basil quote, if we turn away from evil out of fear of punishment, we are only in the position of slaves. If we pursue the enticement of wages, we resemble mercenaries. If we obey for the sake of love, for the sake of the good itself, and out of love for him who commands, then and only then are we in the position of God's children. That's what the sevenfold covenant is for. And that's why I'm convinced God has called us all to share in this week of Jubilee. To share seven days of vacation and prayer. And by the way, it may not be a pilgrimage where we undergo all kinds of hardships like they did to the Holy Land or like I did in March when we went to Rome. This is more vacation than pilgrimage. But we can still transform this into a week of Jubilee through prayer, through daily Mass. Father Rich will be available for confession through entering into fraternity, friendship with our brothers and sisters. I have one brother and one sister, and I'd like to ask you to pray for my brother, Fritz. He was hit by a, a truck in downtown Pittsburgh a month ago, and he nearly died. He's undergoing three months of rehab. I told him I was going to ask you all to pray for him. Uh, it's really, he was lucky to, to live, but now he really sees it as a moment that God has intended, because he has been far from God in many ways, but he sees this as a call to kind of reassess his life. And so please pray for Fritz. But, you know, I have a, a natural bond with Fritz and a natural bond with Barb. They're my brother and sister. I have a supernatural bond with all of you through the Eucharistic flesh and blood of Christ. That isn't less real of a family. That's even more. It isn't earthly or human or temporary. It's divine, it's heavenly, and it's eternal. And so let's forgive each other, let's love each other, and let's pray for each other and enter more deeply into friendships and ask our Father, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the way in which you have laid the foundation for all of our life in the covenant of creation, in a sevenfold covenant that transformed time and space into an intimate place where you gather us as your children. It's almost too good to be true, but you sent your son to die and rise that we might believe. And so in his holy name and by his sacred heart and precious blood, we invoke your help. So help us, God, to live the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. And hear us as we pray that family prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women and blessed is the fruit of thy Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, Pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen.